Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're going to be talking about the new one. Yes, for real, we're actually doing this. The uh, much forgotten 6th gen video game system that once competed briefly versus the Dreamcast, PlayStation 2, GameCube, and original Xbox. Specifically, we'll be focusing on this, the Ares 64, which is a controller adapter that allows you to use Nintendo 64 controllers on the system. Before we do that, though, if you guys could do me a favor, please like this video, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done that before. Have you ever heard of a new one? Seriously, talk to me about it. Let's, let's actually have a discussion about this. I'm curious how many people have ever heard of this and who's here just because... They were just curious what I had to say about it. Um, also, if you guys could do me a favor, in the description, you will find a link to my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, Spreadshirt, all that sort of stuff. It's all in there. I appreciate the support on all those platforms. Please give me the follows and all that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now, yes, the point of this video is ultimately we will be reviewing this controller converter. Uh, but, and I wouldn't normally do this, uh, but I also feel because this system is so obscure to the point where even I hadn't heard of it until only a few years ago, I feel a refresher course on the history of the system is important. If you already know the history and you truly don't care about that, you just want the review, or if you just want less of me talking but you still clicked on the video anyway, uh, I will display a time code there, right there on that screen. Let's make use of that space. And you can go ahead and skip ahead to just that review part. Otherwise, you're sticking around for a history lesson. Eh? Okie dokie. So I actually did do a video on this system retroactively for my 6th gen recap. Um, this is a bizarre system, but in, in a nutshell, let's just, we'll compress it this way. There was a company called VM Labs that was actually comprised entirely of Atari, uh, former Atari developers. And in a sense, this is the successor to the Atari Jaguar. Uh, they just decided they wanted to make a new system, but their philosophy was a little bit different on it, uh, and it's best compared to, say, the PlayStation 2, in the sense that the PlayStation 2, Sony decided we're going to make a video game system and put a DVD player in it. Uh, VM Labs approached it the opposite direction. They're like, let's make a DVD player and put a video game system in it. And what I mean by that was, you see there's two different systems here. This isn't even, this is tip of the iceberg. This is all I own. There's tons of models of the new one. The basic idea was if we just go with these like standard DVD players that people are buying, we could just integrate our chipset and our controller ports and put it into the system and kind of call it a day. Uh, that way people like, you know, companies like Toshiba and Samsung, RCA, there's a few others, they don't have to do a whole lot and then they get this huge potential bonus feature out of their hardware that makes it special, unique, interesting, and potentially can make it sell more. Um, and thus the new one was born. But you do have to remember, this thing came out in the summer of 2000, and that was the height of the DVD revolution. And keep in mind that the PlayStation 2 had not yet launched in North America that would really push that forward uh, in the United States and Canada, and I think to Europe, to, in Europe to some extent. Um, but basically what I'm saying is you have to remember where they were at that point in time, what the history of it was and the mindset of it was. Because on paper, it wasn't actually a terrible plan. If you think about it, the sense was, okay, the DVD revolution is here. People didn't really know what the tech actually was. They just understood movies are going to be cheaper now. They're going to be better quality. And I guess they have these things called bonus features. Oh, I don't even, I don't have to rewind the disc. That's cool. Coming off the back of VHS, of course. Um, and so if you went into the store and you saw one of these DVD players, how do you distinguish it from the other ones that are available? Which one's the good one? Which one's the bad one? This one's called a new one. It's, it's made by Toshiba. I've heard of Toshiba. Uh, I've heard of Samsung. Well, what's new one? Well, I'm going to ask the guy who works here. What was he got to say? He's like, well, the new one, it's going to have these extra bonus features. Bonus features? Remember how VHS didn't come with bonus features because it was just a streamlined cassette tape? You can have bonus features. Well, okay, a lot of DVDs have bonus features. Why is the new one any different? Well, we're going to have new one enhanced DVDs. And those enhanced DVDs will have extra bonus features that are more bonus, more extra. I actually have one right here. This is a movie called Bedazzled, Brendan Fraser, Elizabeth Hurley movie. Uh, if you actually look on the back of this, on the bottom right, there is actually a Nuon logo. This is one of, I think there was only four DVDs that actually used this. I think all of them were actually from 20th Century Fox at the time. Planet of the Apes, the Tim Burton one. Uh, there was a Dr. Doolittle movie, one of the Ed Murphy ones, and then, or Eddie Murphy ones, and then there was another movie, I don't remember off the top of my head, but they had extra features where if you put this into a new one, it would detect it accordingly and be like, okay, you cool, son, you get to actually see the special bonus features. 
what's up? Yeah, and so that that was kind of the initial selling point. But also, video games. Why not? We're gonna we're putting the special chip in there. Let's let's make some use of that. So they actually developed specific video games for it. And this is kind of where the Atari legacy comes in because the like the best game on the system is typically considered to be um, Tempest Three Thousand. But there's also things that were definitely Atari legacy. We have Iron Soldier Three over there, uh, then a, and a few others. But ultimately. Oh, and uh, Merlin Racing, which I think was one of their big ones, that Atari was, was kind of the successor to Atari Karts. Like, it was, it was all there. Um, but in the end, only eight games for this thing ever officially came out. One of which is so obscure, it only came out in South Korea. Uh, I'll show some photos of it. We know it exists, but this game is so rare and bizarre, it has never been dumped online. There are no copies of it known to exist other than the hands of a few collectors. So... That sucks, but the other seven games have all been dumped online, which is pretty cool because this system actually reads burn discs, which is nice because if you want to check those out, you can. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we have eventually kind of gravitated that into a bit of an indie movement. Before we get to that, though, let's talk about one of the core problems with this system. Not necessarily the pricing or any of that. Again, on paper, it was all kind of fine. The biggest issue, if you ask me, the thing that doomed this system, other than the obvious fact that the, the PlayStation 2 was right around the corner, again, you have to remember the era it came out and nobody knew who was going to win that. Um, this is the only system I can think of in history that was not bundled with any sort of controller. Yeah. It came out originally with just standard DVD remotes, which again made sense. They, they were kind of going like, well, it's a DVD player. Sure. So, like, this is the Toshiba one, the one on top. This is the remote for the Samsung on the bottom. But if you were that guy who actually bought it thinking, all right, I'm going to get a little more bang for my buck. Not only do I get the DVD player with those special bonus features, but if I have a kid and he wants to play these video games, maybe he's not going to bug me up about this PlayStation thing coming up. I don't know there's this Dreamcast thing that came out. I don't, you know, whatever. If I get him this, maybe he won't care. But that guy didn't know the thing doesn't come with a real controller. The little Billy ain't playing anything on this. That's not happening. So you'd have to go out and buy a controller. Well, Nuon controllers were pretty obscure. There was no standardization to the Nuon. Um, in fact, like, it, they made a bunch of strange choices. Like, we got a couple of controllers here that I'll show you in a second, but, like, they're not uniform. They weren't even all released by the same company. It was just kind of whoever wants to make a thing, go ahead and make a thing. Which was... <laughs> <laughs> kind of a bad strategy, to be honest, um, and it led to a lot of odd choices. Uh, but you know what? Let's just talk about these controllers. So when the controller actually did come out, we had a few different iterations of it made by a bunch of different people, and you had to actually go out of your way to buy that. Like, you would have had to have thought of it and then done it and actually wanted to spend the money on it, which a lot of people wouldn't have done, especially when you're trying to trick these people into like this new market technology they're not too familiar with. Why would they go out of their way to think they need a new controller? They're not gonna know that. Uh, that, if you ask me, was just the dumbest move they made because it just doomed the system right there. Um, in fact, and to make matters even worse, I don't totally blame them for this, but it is technically their fault. The controller ports on the system are basically proprietary ports. They weren't they're not USB. Granted, USB was in its infancy at the time, and I don't blame them for not using USB at the time, but like it didn't, it wasn't standard to anything else. So really, there was a very logical scenario in which you would end up with a new one, you kind of want to play these games, and you just don't have access to a controller, because they barely made any, and if you look online today, these controllers are absurdly expensive, which is sad, because these controllers suck. So let's actually talk about them. Now, I don't actually own any Nuon controllers. You're seeing, like, entirety of my Nuon collection here in front of you. I got two of the systems out of I don't know how many they made. It was a lot. In fact, I think this system is unique in the fact... It's unique for a couple of reasons, but one of which is it's probably the only system in history where there's more iterations of the hardware of the console than there are actual games released for it. Eight games officially, and I'm pretty sure there's more than eight versions of the system, which is insane. Um, it's also, by the way, the last time 
that any company not named Sega, Nintendo, Microsoft, or Sony made a serious attempt at getting into the home console market. If you're an old dude like me, you'll remember there was a time where random companies would show up and be like, I'm gonna make a game system and it failed. Um, this was the last gasp of that era. And before you point out things like Leapfrog or the uh, Hyperscan, those were never really intended to be serious competitors. Nobody in their right mind thought the Hyperscan was gonna take on the 360. It was more like, we'll just trick grandmas into thinking this is what kids want. That's not a real, this thing had technology in it that was comparable to all of its contemporary rivals. The graphical fidelity and all that was very much on par with what the PlayStation 2 was going to offer to you. So it's, it was the last time anybody made an effort like that that wasn't one of those companies. It's almost fitting that it was sort of kind of Atari, I guess. But yes, the controllers that actually did exist. Now, I don't own any. These controllers are expensive as hell. They're hundreds and hundreds of dollars for controllers that feel like they belong in a Goodwill junk bin. So how did I get any? Well, I want to uh, give a big shout out to a guy in my Discord, which by the way, join my Discord if you haven't. People just talk about all sorts of stuff in there all day long, including obscure things like the Nuon. Uh, there's a guy in there who also happens to live here in Chicago that we refer to as the sentient ice cream man. He is basically ice cream that has formed into an entity. Uh, which you might be envisioning a snowman, but that term is actually racist against him, so don't do that. Be cool, be smart. <laughs> I am kidding. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so I went over and hung out with him for a bit, and he loaned me a couple of Nuon controllers. Um, this first one up, I mean, this is called the HPI 2000. Uh, and one of the, I mean, in addition to this controller just being really uncomfortable and feeling like a mid 90s PC controller, it actually has compatibility issues because it doesn't have a thumbstick. And it was really weird to me when I looked at it and the first thing I thought of was the Apple Pippin controller. And yeah, you weren't expecting me to whip out an Apple Pippin controller or even mention it in this video, did you? But I found a way to work it in, didn't I? This thing has more advanced movement. It's got the, the mouse ball there. This thing, if you could make it work on the new one, would be more compatible with the new one than the actual new one controller. Like, there are games that do not function with this controller just because it doesn't have the thumbstick. That should tell you everything you, know. you need to know. Like, Freefall 3050 AD over there, I believe, doesn't technically work correctly with this controller. So the, the controller people like the most on this thing is the Logitech controller. This one was clearly inspired by the PlayStation 2 controller, what was about to become the PlayStation 2 controller. Uh, it has, you know, triggers on the back. The color scheme was very similar to what... Uh, Sony was doing at the time. The Nuon logo is very prominently displayed there in the center and it actually becomes a button. This is probably the best controller on the system, but it still feels kind of cheap and not a great controller. But, it, but regardless, it doesn't matter. You can't get these without spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So what do you do? Enter Songbird Productions and the Independent Movement. The independent movement has actually produced stuff like this. That disc right there, which is still sealed up, was an indie disc released years ago that actually not only has emulators, it's got like Atari 2600 emulators and stuff, I'm looking at the back here. It also has uh, bonus music files and game files, demos, and whole games. Like there's actually an iteration of Doom that runs on this thing, which I believe is actually, yeah, it's on there, it says it. So you can play Doom on it, that's official, it's the law. You have to be able to get Doom to run on everything, so it actually does, which is great. Um, but Songbird Productions over there, they, uh, I gotta give these guys the biggest shout out in the world because not only do they make this video possible, but also if you're even remotely interested in the Nuon, these are the guys to check out. I'll put a link in the description to the Area 64 specifically, but also what they're, they're working on over there. So the, uh, so the first thing that I'm aware of that they had anything to do with is with the Nuon was actually over there, you see Iron Soldier 3. Uh, that was based on, you know, Iron Soldier 1 and 2, which were, of course, Atari games. The third one only came out, at least initially, on the new one. I believe there's also a PS1 version of it, oddly enough. Um, that game is pretty uncommon, the original version of it, because it actually has a bug in the game that doesn't allow it to work on certain versions of the new one. As I said, the new one kind of sucked with its standardization. There was, it wasn't entirely consistent, which is definitely a downfall element, but that version of the game only works on certain builds of the system. In fact, that unfortunately, while it was cool that he was able to do a re-release, that's an officially licensed re-release, pressed copy, all that. And it doesn't try to pretend it's the original, it shows the Songbird logo and everything. That version of the game still has the same bug because it was, wasn't possible to fix it. And what we noticed was 
It doesn't work on these two versions of the system, but when I went out to visit the Sentient Ice Cream Man, he had, uh, I believe it was the RCA edition, and he had a different Samsung model, and that disc worked no problem on the Samsung model. So it's, like I said, Nuon was annoyingly inconsistent, but that's why that game was uh, pulled in the first place. Point is, if you want that game, though, that's a great way to do it, so I was happy to get that. Uh, also, just as a nice little bonus, he sent me the re-release, because he did a limited edition here of uh, Freefall 3050 AD, which is, I have that game originally so it was just cool but it's like you know slightly different artwork and different manual and all that but also just making it more widely available but if you think about it, he's released two of the eight games that exist so i hope that they continue to do that get licensing to hopefully release something like tempest 3000 because that's one of the better games um speaking of that though let's actually fire the system up and actually do something here so i believe i am using the top console but yeah, we got the Ares 64. So let's talk all about it. What is the point of the Ares 64? The Ares 64 is really just designed to give you a cheap and efficient way to actually play the new one. Now, obviously what it does is it connects to the system and then from there you can connect a Nintendo 64 controller to the system. So I've got three of them and uh, that's pretty cool, but two of them will get returned to where they came from. And over here now you can see the new one boot up screen. Uh, we'll just let that load. Unfortunately, the load times on the new one not great, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, so the adapter uh, is pretty simple to use. So you just plug it in directly into the system. Now, interestingly, when they made it, there was, as I said, it was a proprietary connection. So there was no great way to uh, connect the system. Uh, so they ended up using what I can, uh, what apparently are firewire cables that are just kind of retrofitted for this purpose and when you go to plug it in it might seem a little unnatural uh but you actually plug there's like a delta in it the delta has to go like up i'll show you in the footage um but that that will totally work and then thus it's connected now if you look down here on this thing you'll actually see there's a red light on this one because this is the one that's actually uh linked up that red light basically just indicates that the unit is receiving power and that everything is good to go. Uh, the unit itself, there's not much to it. You know, it's just like a 3D printed case, says Ares 64, Ares 64. It has the Songbird logo, you know, it has obviously the cable out to the system and then it has the input jack for the N64. Not much else going on with it that you really need to, that's all that important. Uh, when the controller is connected, one of the things it will do is that it will actually flicker when it receives a button prompt, uh, thus basically confirming for you that the controller is in fact functional. You guys can see it better than I can, but the point is you can see that it is actually functional. It's obeying commands. And I mean, I, obviously I played it, you know, from a better angle. I'm, I can't see at all what I'm doing. I know I'm turning, this is Tempest 3000 by the way, and admittedly a burned copy because I don't know. I think I just beat the first level without even looking. Boom, that's skills or not. But either, the point is, it, as you can see, it totally works. Anyway, we're going to stop playing that for the moment, and uh, I'll have to turn off the screen just because the lighting really makes it a lot worse over here. As I must stress again, the Nuon was non-standard. So it didn't always do everything uniformly, which is always a bad idea in a video game console. Uh, so when they made this, they actually developed it with like two different models of the Nuon in mind. So they were testing on everything and everything seemed fine. And when I got it, I noticed a problem relatively quickly. It works on this one, as you saw, no issue. I would try to use it on the Samsung and then realized I couldn't. Uh, and the reason I couldn't is because while the Toshiba one here, you know, the, the ports are very open and exposed, easy to get to, the Samsung one below it, the ports are kind of, you know, inside of a, a little like shell type of, well not a shell, but they're just kind of housed further in. And there isn't enough space to get the head of this in there. Uh, because it's just it just wasn't long enough and these like rubber parts were actually blocking it So I contacted the guys at Songbird and I was like were you aware of this? And They're like no you're the first person who's tested on that because let's keep it real This is an obscure kind of thing. They're only I think they're only making 125 of these They might make more later. We'll you know depending on how it goes point is as I said, non-uniform, there's so many iterations of the hardware, it's kind of hard to, to be sure. So I'm glad they sent it to me for testing because I told them that and they're like, I think we can fix that. So they, they basically just sent me two more uh, and then they shaved off the edges a bit at different lengths just to see like what would work. Fortunately, both shaved off ones worked just fine. It wasn't a matter of, in that case, the hardware exactly. It was just that it couldn't physically fit in there because this rubber part was blocking it. So if you do want to get one of these, they are willing to cut the, the rubber bit you know, down a little bit more so that it definitely will fit if you have that bottom one. 
But at the same time, these are the only two new ones I've got, so these are the only two I could test it with. So I would recommend having it shaved down in general because I don't know the lengths of all the different ports. Um, but yeah, all good. Uh, so that was just issue number one, which is, I guess, ostensibly uh, 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 repaired for all, all intents and purposes. The other one was I decided to test it, obviously, with a bunch of different N64 controllers. You just saw me playing it with the wired uh, Brawler 64 from Retro Fighters. I've done a whole video on this. This is a great controller. Unfortunately, this controller is no longer in production. They do a wireless one, which we'll get back to in a second. Uh, but I tested with that, as you saw, it worked fine. I tested it with the stock N64 controller, no problem there. I tested it with the RetroBit um, Tribute 64, no problem there. I did not test it with like every third party controller ever made for the N64, but I would assume the vast majority of them work just fine. Where I got a little bummed out, and I'm sorry to break everybody's hearts here, is the wireless version of the Brawler 64 that has like the little dongle. This didn't really work properly. Um, it, the connection would often not sync correctly, or it would drop entirely, or if it did connect, the game would not really run it properly. Like, it's like you would see the start menu or something like that, and the, it would just kind of wildly freeform, like, move around when it's not supposed to. Like, I think if, if you see, like, three options on a menu, right, it would just, like, cycle and not really obey your commands. It was, and sometimes it would work, but a lot of times it wouldn't. Enough to the point where I have to tell you that if you're thinking, hey, I'll get this, and then I'll use my brawler wireless controller, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that course of action. I had a lot of problems doing that. Wired controllers, no problem at all. Wireless, yeah, unfortunately I did. So overall, can I recommend this thing? Absolutely, if you are a guy who wants a new one, has a new one, you wanna play it, and you don't wanna spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on controllers, this is a pretty good alternative. I asked them actually why they picked the N64, because that seemed kind of strange. And they're like, well, first of all, there actually was a Nuon controller that was basically an N64 clone, so that actually made sense. But also, it satisfied every need. You know, there were button mapping for, you know, every game. It, it, it was like everything they needed was right there. And on top of that, N64 controllers are very cheap. They're very common. And yet, as we just pointed out with three of these here, they're still in production to a certain extent. You can still get new ones. So it made perfect sense. If you're interested in this, you can check out a link in the description to this. I'll also put a link to Nuon Dome, which is like a fan community thing that talks all about the Nuon and what's going on with it, etc. And don't forget, there are Facebook groups even about the Nuon. If, you have, if you're that guy out there who actually wants to talk Nuon, you are not actually alone, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, that's really all I have to say about it. Thank you, huge shout out to Songbird, and don't worry, I will be returning the other two uh, <laughs> very soon. I'll actually be returning them to Midwest Gaming Classic. I'm gonna be a guest at Midwest Gaming Classic where you can actually buy these on site, is my understanding. So go to Midwest Gaming Classic in Milwaukee. So yeah, that'll do it for now. Thank you very much to uh, Songbird Productions. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please like this video, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done that before, as well as hit me up on the social media stuff again in the description, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, uh, Spreadshirt, etc. Thank you so much for the support and I'll see you all later.